Welcome everyone, and we are very excited about today's webinar. Uh, this is the fourth in a series of Grow Up webinars, all in efforts to keep our interest and keep us entertained and informed uh, during this pandemic. And leading us up to our hopeful conference in mid-June uh, in Victoria, and if not a definite conference uh, in Niagara in September. So we look forward to seeing you in person there. Um, and before we get on to today's exciting uh, webinar, uh, I do want to just remind you that all of our webinars are, uh, previous webinars are posted on the Grow Up Conference website, as will this one. And so we, we look forward to, to encouraging you to share any of these uh, videos uh, with, with those who can't attend today. And before I talk more about this uh, upcoming webinar, I do want to talk to you a little bit about the Grower's Source. Uh, come the Grow Up Conference is a proud sponsor of Grower Source, uh, which is a uh, four-day workshop uh, with a, uh, uh, speakers as well as a virtual trade show. And uh, the Grow Up Conference is the keynote presenter, and we should be talking uh, about craft cannabis. So look forward to uh, checking that out on January 27th. Um, now, uh, during this, uh, this webinar, you will see an opportunity to ask questions, so feel free to look down in, in, the, in the Zoom panel, and there's a question and answer area, there's also the chat, feel free to ask questions, I'll be uh, streaming that to, to pick out some questions for, for Jeff at the end of the presentation. Uh, and before we go to Jeff, I have the uh, proud opportunity to introduce uh, part of this amazing duo and um, uh, introduce Dale Sky Jones from Oaksterdam University, Executive Chancellor. And if you've had the opportunity to check out California 90420, um, you will get an opportunity to learn a little bit more <laughs> about uh, Dale Sky and Oaksterdam. So with that, I turn it over to you, Dale. Uh, wow, <laughs> that is... Absolutely a blast from the past. Thank you. Yes, I just wanted to join this morning to say hello to our grow up friends and those of you north of the border and uh, to briefly introduce Oaksterdam. Uh, for those of you that don't know us, we, we did get started officially in 2007 um, and have evolved to offer a, a full slate of different types of courses. So a full service educational institution. We've now trained over 50,000 people from over 40 countries uh, since we were first founded uh, all those years ago. Um, but what really makes us special is, is actually our next, next instructor and what he did in the 25 years uh, before now. Many times it's the shoulders we stand on and I was lucky enough to meet and marry uh, and then have kids. <laughs> so Oaksterdam uh, has many different ways of finding family. Sometimes it's a partnership in business and sometimes it's a partnership in life. Um, but I, I've already heard a few of your speakers um, that have actually uh, found their business and their um, life partners at Oaksterdam. So I know that our family reaches deep. Um, across the border with the Grow Up family. And uh, it's part of the reason I just wanted to be here this morning to say, hi, we're still here, come visit us. We now have virtual classes, so you don't have to come to Oakland anymore, uh, nor do you have to cross the, that border uh, that has gotten more and more difficult um, in, in these days of COVID. So you can go virtual. We have live cohorts that you can interact with, with folks around the world. And we do have a new one starting in March, uh, or you can just self-pace it, um, you know, 2 a.m. in your underwear on the couch, because we do ask that you wear pants when you come to class on video. Um, and I do also want to just double check uh, to make sure that uh, Mr. Jones is able to join here shortly uh, on, on video and get some type of signal for that. But I do want to point out, Jeff Jones started this 25 years ago as an educational endeavor, yes, but to supply necessary cannabis to the medical patients in the California Bay Area. And this, this kid from South Dakota bicycling across the Bay Bridge to get to the SF patients um, and sitting at the feet of Dennis Crone finally realized that he could do this and do it well by working with a city. 
And so I'm telling you this because I want to point out that just about everything that you see going on today from the original structures of the regulatory regime starting early on in California uh, all the way through becoming the blueprint for legalization. Uh, we are here with you and he has been teaching cannabis for a quarter century, but I dare say he's been into bugs for a decade more than that. And with that, I'd like to introduce Jeff Jones. He was the founder of the Oakland Cannabis Buyers Cooperative that went to the Supreme Court and he's co-founder of Oaksterdam University. I know you'll have fun. I'm glad we got our tech going. And I really look forward to seeing you all on the flip side, hopefully in one of our live cohorts, if you like what you see here and you want more, we'll see you at oaksterdam.com. Have a beautiful day and enjoy Mr. Jeff Jones. Good morning, everyone, or afternoon where you're at. Um, I just shared uh, my slide deck with you and we're gonna move rather fast today because I've got lots of information to share with you. Uh, as Dale mentioned, I think I was into bugs before I was into plants. Uh, it's actually 40 plus years that I've been to insects and things that walk around. I thought I was gonna be a plant bug kind of scientist guy and I turned out to be a cannabis enthusiast. Uh, I got detoured when I was young with cannabis and I quickly saw that we needed to change the policies and I jumped off the cliff and wanted to get involved and moved to California when I was 19 and got sued federally when I was 23. And the rest is kind of history. Today though, we're gonna focus on plants and the things that really affect them, pests and pathogens. Uh, I think the key thing about plants is that they, I like to say are not going to talk to us, but we have to become kind of good plant whisperers. And when there's bugs and pathogens, molds, mildews on them, they do not do as well. And they start to frown by not getting feedback from us to try to take those problems away. When we're indoor gardening, we're the person, we're going to be the more or less the interceptor of that safety as the farmer. When we're outside, we kind of have to learn to live with the bigger ecosystem. And there's two different ways really to farm when it comes to that. One's more sustainable because you have to work with the outside environment. And the other one is conventional, but definitely leads to different produce or different flower crops that we pull off the plant. Today, we're gonna to go through pests, the life cycles a little bit, common pathogens, their life cycles a little bit, because if you wanna create a, a stopgap for having these things inside, you first have to identify the problems. Uh, if you're going to go to war, as I like to say, I leave no prisoners on the, the ground. I'm gonna kill everything if it's going to be indoors and greenhouses because I don't want bugs or pathogens on the plant. If it's outside open canopy, we kind of have to figure out what we're doing to live with the environment seasonally as it gets worse or gets better depending upon what climate you're in. So those are the geographical factors that we'll talk about just briefly. And then we're gonna get into prevention, treatment, because I think prevention's better than treatment. If we don't have the problem, we don't have to treat very much and our labor costs go down and our quality of life for the plant and the produce that it produces goes way up. And that really has to do with each farmer or each facility implementing a good strong IPM program. And we'll talk about that in the, the last kind of part of the class today. Um, what I can say about bugs is that they come in all forms. Uh, the first one that we're gonna talk about that's probably most common and is very, very much identified as a small, almost arachnid-like little spider is a spider mite. And what the problem with these are, it's not that they fly, but they can transport themselves in the air through webbing like a, a small spider would catch the wind. It's that they're very pervasive and that their life cycle is very fast. So these small arachnids have eight legs, four kind of on each side, and the main problem that they create is they go in and actually poke into the leaf and cause damage uh, that you normally see the damage on the plant before you see these small microscopic insects unless you're looking you know because these arachnids are rather small not normally visual to the eye the the slide shows you one that's microscoped in and you can see eggs and adults that are present and those are the two spotted spider mites that are the most common throughout the cannabis world and they they suck the essence of the plant they get into the foliage they're around in the in the leaves and the stalks but they can also be down in the medium whether you're growing in rock wool as the plant that's behind me or you're growing in something more conventional like soils and coconut fiber. The eggs can be in the medium, so can the adults. Um, they can transport themselves around, so it's not just that you have to worry about them only being on the plant. Most of the bugs that we'll talk about today are gonna thrive in warmer climates. They don't have a metabolism that's warm-blooded like us. They're cold-blooded, so they do better and thrive and have a faster life cycle when the rooms are warm or the growing garden area space is warm. 
outdoors where the night gets cold, especially in Northern California, the bud life cycle slows down and that's where the farmer tries to get in between their life cycle and stop them from procreating. Because that's what we're gonna learn about today with almost all of the insects, the arachnids, the bugs that we deal with, it's stopping them before they get around in the circle that is really the biggest prevention. So it's up to us to identify what they are and then figure out the best preventative and treatment mechanisms. And with spider mites, we have the two-spotted spider mite, which is mainly on the, the big fan leaves throughout some of the stalk areas. And if it webs up, can be all over the flowers and the tips. But the more recent one that has come on the scene is the hemp russet mite, the broad mite. There may be a couple of species that we're playing with here and they are highly microscopic. They're the type that if you don't have something well above a magnifying glass or a small jeweler's loop, you're not even gonna really see these. The visual eye won't let you see what these are. You're really gonna to need to get in and microscopically look at the plant. Even a digital magnifying glass would be prevalent. Their life cycles are also rather fast. They speed up as the room temperature goes up and they slow down slightly as it doesn't. Now, <clears throat> they're going to hatch and be present mostly at the top of the growing tips. So the plant looks like it has a rust or some type of a mold or a blight and the tips just kind of frown over. What I can say about that <clears throat> is that it's up to you to act quickly because once these get out of control, they've become a menace on large facility gardens where they have to turn rooms completely out and make sure that they're not bringing them back in. They're microscopic. They're usually transported on clones or live plant material that goes in and out of rooms. And it also brings mold or other types of problems as you get dead and dying foliage because of how quickly they affect the plant. They, as you can see, a little bit different looking than the, the small spider mite, which is more kind of almost oval. These look more like a slug and they have two little kind of legs sticking out in the front. Even though they have eight legs, the, the four that are in the front act as like little crawlers and they move really slow. So these are not known very well to fly unless you're shaking the plant, they're gonna be stuck on the plant. And I find that foggers, <clears throat> what's shown here is pyruthrins, types of treatments that are going to knock it back are probably best. I've also found in, is allowed in Canada is sulfur evaporant burners are really great for miticides because they fog the room. And we'll talk about those a little later. Um, what I can say about soil gardening is that it's great for reusing the, the substrate medium, but it is a hardship because it usually comes with live insects, bugs, and of course the organic soil food web. What is most prevalent in soil and some mediums is fungus gnats. They live in the medium. The small larvae look like little grubs and they eat roots, dead organic material. The, the adult flies smell rotting material and want to go lay their eggs there. They have a fairly quick life cycle. They turn over in about two to three weeks. The real hardship of eradication is that they're in the medium. So you have to treat the roots and the medium with sometimes not very friendly types of insecticides. Um, what's pictured here is gonads, a watering agent, sticky traps, things like that to identify them. Most indoor gardeners rid themselves of the mechanism of bringing it in, which is soil, and try to grow with a medium that is more inert and isn't been contaminated. Coconut fibers, things like that are also prone to be best. What I can say about fungus gnats, they don't do heavy damage to the plant. The insects that fly up normally get stuck in the flowers and they don't really eat on it. The roots, if are heavily attacked by the, the larva side, could be damaged and hurt the plant's production. But when you're outdoors, the rest of the other insect world usually takes care of them getting out of control. So they're mainly an, um, an indoor problem, especially in greenhouses where we get controlled warm environments to help turn their life cycle up. Now, here in the Bay Area, uh, I've known thrips to be very seasonal. They don't usually come around in the wintertime that we're in right now where they're cold outside, but in the dry, warm summers in California, you'll see them creeping into greenhouses, indoor rooms, garages, crawl spaces, and they're small. They can crawl right through a window screen, and these fly slightly different than the fungus gnats that we showed before, which kind of operate like a drunk bumblebee and zigzagging around and not really able to go long distances. The thrip operates like a dragonfly or a jet. It can jump up, take off, and then travel almost 20 feet within one flight distance. So it can travel out of a room, land on you, transport into other rooms. So it's a, it's a vector for cross-contamination. But what really is the damage with this one is the adults and the larvae have like a raspy mouth that eats the leaves so that they eat part of the top surface and then they cause an infection zone. So vectors of diseases can get back into the plant. So if you're growing mothers or adults that you're cutting clones from, allowing thrips to eat on your plants will likely get your plant contaminated and you'll be more or less 
breeding forward contamination or more or less drifted mutated strains. So these are, are known to be wanting to be removed even in large grows because they heavily affect the leaves, which are our solar panels for the energy into the plant to get us the big robust flowers that we're all seeking. And as a good plant whisperer, somebody that's gonna hear the plant, if I see dishappy leaves or molding or folding, I'm thinking bugs first, molds or mildews, and then maybe a problem with the actual stuff that's in the, the nutrients or what's in the medium. But usually nine times out of 10, it's something that's affecting the, the plant like an insect. And <clears throat> what I find with thrips is they're not always attracted to yellow sticky traps. Sometimes they need a, a, a different color for them to be effective. And sticky traps are not a control as much as of identifier agents for you to see when you're not in the room. If they get stuck and you can look at them with a good jeweler's loop, something that you'll be able to see close enough for them to be identified. Our goal as a good plant horticulturist is to lessen the impact of these bugs and pathogens to the plant to better the outcomes of the flowers. And uh, thrips do a heavy amount of damage. They're normally very active in the warmest time of the, of the seasonal growing cycle, much like fleas. I kind of call these fleas for plants. When you have flea problems on your pets, you're likely gonna see thrips and you should be reacting to them before they get out of control. A good farmer is gonna guarantee success by minimizing the problems that are affecting the plant or the cultivated crop that they're working with. Now, I'm moving fast and, and white flies are, are not my favorite. They're easy to treat in my mind. They do fly, but they're a little slower. They operate like a moth. They don't fly long distances, but they can get around in the room and land on you. What I don't like about them is when I've been working in gardens, they tend to fly into me, into my mouth, into my ears or my nose. I've eaten a few of them over the years. If I work in a garden where you shake the plant, they get disrupted and they wanna fly away, they're gonna to try to hide. They know that they're very light colored. They're almost like an iridescent white wings and kind of a fluorescent, almost yellowy green body. And they do a lot of damage to the leaf because their babies, as you see here, are almost look like scale or a mealy bug. And they rove around on the leaf causing damage, defecation, frass left over. And it's not something that you would wanna see on your plant. The infestation molts, causes neurotic spotting of leaves and damages the output of our flowers. Most of the time, as I'll talk in prevention, we wanna focus when the plant is a baby, juvenile or vegging, because once it starts to produce flowers, we really don't have the opportunities to keep the bugs at bay or even knock them off with pesticides. Because remember, this is a produce crop that we're gonna be consuming and we wanna be safe with it because the, the main goal of what we teach at Oaksterdam is to be thoughtful about what we're doing to the environment and to the community that's going to consume it because we're trying to change the way people look at cannabis by not creating the next problem market like what we saw with tobacco. Now, speaking of tobacco for a second, you can use tobacco leaves to actually kill the bugs we're talking about today. It's not as good of a, a pathogen control, but it actually has a nicotine property in it that acts as a poison at the small level of these bugs. And I'm amazed at how much I recommend it and it's used organically in outdoor and greenhouses. And people don't get that smoking it is just a small amount of poison. And we have to titrate what that is both to the plant world and to ourselves to not create problems for the plants but the bugs all die. So um, even if when it comes to aphids, these bugs have leaves, uh, I'm sorry, wings that are not as well situated for letting them fly like a thrip. I liken the, the aphid flight pattern to be kind of like my chickens that I keep. If you have them up high and they fly, they can kind of go a distance, but they're not gonna get up and go very fast because they have a heavy body. And so thrips mainly grow wings to try to get away and procreate around in the gardening space to get new plant material to feed on because they're heavy sap feeders. They have a proboscis mouth, kind of a like a stinging fly or a mosquito that pokes into the stalk, the leaves, and then they just use the flow of the tissue, the pressure in the plant to actually pull out the sugars and the food, which is directly hurting the plant's ability to do what it needs to do to make big flowers. The, the gardening crop quickly goes down as more aphids are present on the plant. This is one of the first bugs that we'll talk about that really symbiotically relates itself to another insect that I studied quite a lot when I was a little kid, ants. Ants will move aphids into the gardening area in greenhouses, even in crawl spaces or indoor gardens in your home. Once they find a suitable place for them to harvest the, the honeydew off of the aphid, they'll quickly move as many adult females to more or less harvest another crop of aphids. They are farming the aphids much like we farm the cannabis plant or produce, and they know what they're doing. They're gonna protect it. 
and they'll keep moving them around. So with aphids, if you have a continual problem, you have to deal with the underlying ant problem normally that's bringing them in because they're feeding off of the secretion of the, the aphid, which is a, a sugary substance. I liken it to being uh, like they found their, their addictive substance that they don't want to give up and they'll go to war to protect it. Uh, also, one of the predator bugs that we'll talk about, I think, has a sugar tooth, the ladybug. And it prefers aphids because I think they taste like gummy bears. I kind of know they taste like sugar because I've eaten some before. Um, but the point that I'm making with this is that we want to think about these insects really doing damage to the plant and whether they're a spider mite that's very microscopic or an aphid that we can literally see with the visual eye. It's on the stalk and it kind of gets out of control very quickly. We're going to need to remove them and keep them at bay. And we can use bacteriums, pesticides, things that are going to deter them from being on the plant. But we want to make sure that we're keeping the plant safe and not getting it more or less residual uh, insecticide on it that we're going to consume later. I don't want to stand on the caterpillar too long because if you're an indoor gardener, you don't normally get these unless you have a, a, a drafty door or an open window where a moth or a butterfly will fly in, see the canopy of leaves, deposit eggs, and a couple of weeks later, you're going to have baby caterpillars. Outdoors, these are quite common from spring to summer to fall. They continue to hatch and become present on the plant, and they do a lot of damage. They're heavy eaters. They completely defoliate sides of plants or areas where they have more or less robust, robust amount of foliage, and they defecate as they move. So the bigger problem with caterpillars is as the plant starts to develop flowers, they crawl inside to hide, and then they just defecate where they're sitting, and you get other types of molds and bacteriums that are growing on the plant. And you preferably won't want to stay away from botrytis, which is a, a bud rot mold that once it starts in one bud, it grows systemically in the plant and takes over the whole plant. And there's nothing that you can really do to salvage it as a good farmer. You have to remove it because it also spreads to the other plants as they get affected. And we'll talk more in a second about pathogens. Speaking about caterpillars, and we saw aphids, there is a product that both of them can be used that's bacterium-based very safe, non-insecticidal, can be sprayed up to the week of harvest, uh, safer, and a few companies make it. It's a Bacillus thuringiensis, And there's another varietal that's used for fungal gnat control and insects like uh, mosquito larva. But this one, this version gets on the leaf structure, the caterpillar comes and eats a little bit of it and kind of gets like a gastritis, an upset tummy. And then the next day its, it's stomach explodes and it dies, 100% fatal. It doesn't affect bees, it doesn't affect us or pets or kids, but it's very quick to affect the eating caterpillar larvae that are on the plant. You have to keep reapplying it so it's not something that's systemic, it doesn't stay on the plant. If water comes, it rinses it off and it's gone. So that's mainly the trouble as we'll start to talk about more treatments is that you have to be really repetitive and doing a lot of activity. And that's where we get into the IPM program, which is integratively managing the pest through a program of one, two, three, four, five things that you do per week, not just one. And switching gears for a moment, because what we've been talking about are living organisms, bugs, spiders, insects. They get on the plant, they procreate, and they make more damage to the plant. They feel, they look, they are affected by things. They can build up tolerances to pesticides. So we have to kind of always be focused on how to get, eradicate them best without making them a worse problem. This section is about molds, mildews, things that are gonna be problematic to the plant world in the sense of pathogenic that grow on the plant, can grow into the root structure in the medium, and actually can get up into the tissue being a systemic problem in the plant that you can't cure very easily without taking them to a lab and spending thousands of dollars to get it cleaned up. Um, it's difficult. We've lost a lot of varietals from some of the things that we'll talk about briefly. And it's, <clears throat> it's concerning because some of this is gonna take time to fix, but I really am hopeful that the cannabis agricultural community is going to change produce agriculture because of the high value target that we're growing and the amount of money that's going to be invested to fix our problems that will also fix other agricultural problems. Now, these aren't in order of most prone in your garden, but this could be probably the most damaging. Botrytis, the type of pathogen that grows in the bud and is creating a mold rot that's in the stalk, gets into the stem and is systemic and passed through the tissue of the plant to other buds is usually started from more or less an injured plant, an infected plant, something like I talked about with a caterpillar eating a part of it, defecating and creating a big moldy patch of problems there inside of the flower. 
once it gets set, it's near to impossible to remove from the plant and the plants normally need to be removed from the garden or they're going to transfer it to the other gardening plants. If you're growing hydroponically, they're all likely gonna get it unless they have a, a degree of non-susceptibility. If you're growing in soils, they might be separated by distance. There's things you can do to decontaminate them while they're growing, but they all get very difficult because fungus is among us. It's in the air, it's on the ground. It takes the right niche to take effect, but to think that we're going to rid fungus from all of the environment we're growing in, we have to really grow indoors in controlled environments that are decontaminated with gas. And that's not very friendly to think about, but that's really what's going to keep molds and mildews at a zero, at a zero count. Now, with powdery mildew, this one's a little different because instead of inside of the bud itself growing in, in more or less small areas that creates like a blight, this is a mold that flatly grows on the big surfaces of the fan leaves. It's not always on stalks or petioles or even the sugar leaves or the flowers. If it's really infected and you have high humidity and kind of a dew point problem, you'll get it everywhere on the plant. It can completely cover it, making it look like it's super resonated. But if you look closer and you see that it's actually a mold spore, it's near to impossible to remove from the room because it's already all over the room. It's on the tops of lights, it's on the surfaces of the trays and the liners. So it's usually brought about by poor humidity controls, less air circulation in the room, meaning that we're not dehumidifying and moving the air around as we're growing large cannabis stands or patches inside of small controlled rooms. It's prone inside of tents that don't move air in and out. So we treat with foliar fungicides, we climate control more by turning on air conditioners and dehumidifiers to lower the relative humidity and control the dew point. Compost teas might be used to revitalize the plant and to feed it both topically and on leaves. Although in regulated gardens, you have to be kind of careful because you're putting microbes on the leaves, they may fail tests that are going to be done later on the produce as it gets to market. And of course, filtration and sanitation are key and I think one of the things I use as a go-to weapon that's approved in Canada and is used prevalently in home gardens and was used in California and other states until it was regulated out because of the way it's manufactured is sulfur in a dioxide of gas that treats the whole room and the plant kind of feeding it on a foliar level because sulfur is allowed to soak through the leaves, but also disinfecting all the molds and mildews on contact. And as I mentioned with the russet mite or the broad mite, it is also a miticide. It floats as a gas, much like a fogger that we'll talk about in the room and kills everything that's in the room as you treat it. It's a problem that it's caustic to us. It's a greenhouse gas, but it's agriculturally used heavily in grapes. You go to Sonoma County here, Lake, Napa County that's worldwide known, and the grape farmers smell like rotten eggs because the sulfur that they use in dusted form and fumigants to control the botrytis, the powdery mildew that's on grapes, they have to deal with the same problems we do with pathogens and they control it with rudimentary, very cost-effective measures because they're open canopy outside. They don't grow grapes in greenhouses. So we are learning from that and I want to make sure that we have the access to those kind of degrees of controls for everybody to benefit from because we're gonna be large scale agriculture everywhere in the world. Um, I just somehow paused my share. Hold on just a moment. Am I? We, we can see everything you're, uh, oh, now we can't. We're, we're... Can you see my screen still? Yeah, we can see your screen, great. Great, okay, sorry. Uh, something happened on my machine that caused a pop-up menu, it seems, and lost me. Um, what I can say about powdery mildew is that we're going to get past it. When I first started gardening in small gardens and warehouses underground, we would move out of buildings when we had powdery mildew that we couldn't solve because we didn't understand how to deal with it correctly. Uh, now being an adult uh, and having some seasoned access to rooms and cultivation techniques that were hidden to me, I'm not afraid of bugs and I'm not afraid of paths, path, pathogens and, and molds and mildews. You just have to identify the problem and figure out your best technique to get rid of them. And it always involves integrative pest management control. You gotta do more than one thing. Because mainly when I see newbie gardeners, they're rotting their plants by simply overwatering them. Or as I like to say in class, they're waterboarding their plants to death. It's a slow death. They don't know it right away, but they don't want all the water every day. And so what we are trying to avoid is root rot. If you overwater the medium and it's really boggy and not necessarily got a mix of oxygen and water to it, you're starting a decomposition that is going to happen because roots die. 
And as the roots die, if they're not turned over and grown and, and consumed by the plant, which it does, and they become rotted material, then we're going to get more fatal symptoms. We get into the lack of oxygen at the root level that causes pathogenic and fungal activity that leads to pythium, fusarium, that we'll talk about. Those are systemic, more or less pathogens that get into the root tissue. They're vectored in through cuts, through rotted roots, and then everything goes downhill. As I like to say, if your roots look like overcooked spaghetti or ramen noodles and they're smushy and they don't have any kind of rigidity to them, we have a problem on our hands and you might want to remove them, cutting them away more or less like a, a cancer and getting them out of the garden, disinfecting with a 1% hydrogen peroxide misting mixture or dipping them to avoid the slime and getting the roots back up to their health because if the roots aren't happy, up top in the canopy is going to be even less happy. We have to have healthy roots for a very vigorous plant. If you lose your roots, the up top is going to be dead within hours. So we need to make sure that we're monitoring what's happening down below. And normally we want to connect the person with understanding their mediums, whether they're using a rock wall, a hydroponic system, soils or coconut fiber, minimizing overwatering is the main goal and maximizing drainage and oxygen back in. Most people don't understand the roots breathe. They respirate like us. Everybody's trained that plants produce oxygen, but that's up top in the canopy as they're consuming CO2 to bring carbon into the plant, which is about 95% of what the plant's made of. Down below, it's respirating oxygen to keep the roots happy, much like we do. So we have to kind of think about both sides of the plant. The top is different than the bottom at the root level in the medium. Because when we get a problem that's root rot and it's not checked and disinfected, we're going to get fusarium, pythium was mentioned, verticillin, and these are sometimes incurable problems. The leaf material has the virus in it. If it goes into the reservoir of a new tank, it goes into a soil garden of a new, a new pot, you just got the, the more or less the disease into the new plant system. So these are highly spreadable, like we talk about with COVID and other types of diseases, to other plants in the plant world that are near you or transporting the, the refuse material that we would cut and the, more or less the composted material you would toss out into your yard. If you've got infected plants indoors and you put them in your compost pit, you more or less just spread them to everything that you're gonna put the compost back on. So there's thoughts about cleanliness, sanitary conditions, about what we're doing with the refuse material to separate them, at least until it goes through a full composting cycle. Because if you have a good, healthy compost, the things we're talking about get checked by the healthy, as I say, the light that's inside of the compost instead of the darkness if we wanted to go down that rabbit hole. The, the key to me to keeping the plant happy is to eliminate overwatering and to keep infected possibles of the root level down to a minimum and understand that if you're starting from seeds, you're likely not having these problems that are systemic in the plant. If we're bringing in a clone, something as small as this, easy to treat bugs because it has very small canopy, but it may already be infected with a disease from its mother and are inside of the plant tissue. And it may need to be discarded once we start to flower it and find that it has a, a systemic failure of one of these conditions. The only way to fix it, taking it to a lab. <clears throat> and that's not normally something that any small gardener is going to do unless they're trying to protect an heirloom strain that they're growing as a mother. Now, shifting gears for a second, because I really think that Prevention is really what we want to think about to try to avoid the problems. And we're going to look at ourselves, number one. This is not an order of most problematic. I think people should be at the top of the list because we're bringing all the rest of the problems to the table. We bring tools that are infected, whether we go outside and cut down Canadian ivy that's got mildew on it and bring it into our gardens by our hands or our hair, not showering and disinfecting our hands, whether it's pets that could carry all sorts of bugs on them, or worse yet, as you see the dogs, they're touching their mouth to the leaves. All they've got to do is turn around and what do they leave on the leaves that's there for two weeks? Potential fecal matter that could carry E. coli that could get into our chain system because it can survive in the, in the leaf chain if we were getting it consumed right away. And then we're going to find out about it because somebody died. We've yet to see that in the cannabis industry, but in major agricultural industries, when they have an E. coli issue, it bankrupts that farm. They don't normally do business again. And we should try to avoid those pitfalls by understanding our contaminants, looking at irrigation equipment, making sure that it's disinfected between runs if we've had problems, looking at soils and amendments that we're going to be using to keep our soil food web alive. Clean soil amendments are going to keep our soil much more healthy over time 
most organic farmers are looking at amendments as a possible contaminant, and we're finding heavy metal traces in all sorts of healthy organic soils because this plant is a bioaccumulator. It's a quick, fast grower, but it accumulates mercury, cadmium, arsenic, so we have to even be cautious about organic soils having things in them that we didn't know about because we're in California testing cannabis more than some pharmaceutical drugs. So we're also worried about waterborne pathogens, as we talked about fusarium and pythium. They could come in the water table. Regular tap water has them in them, sometimes filtered out or de more or less disinfected with chlorine or chloramines. We have to do more UV treatments, other types of treatments if we're hydroponically gardening. We have to look at airborne and also infected plants. To me, infected plants are pretty much the, the reason why we bring problems in the garden. We don't quarantine them in between bringing them in and it allows cross-contamination to other rooms. And we have to keep our baby plants and our mother plants cleanest because they're going into the system if we're cutting clones and making a cycle of our own varietals to not go back to the store. If we're buying them from a collective, getting them from a friend, uh, short of starting seeds, I always consider plants to be infected. So we have to look at that as a, as a possibility. Now, um, what I want to talk about with prevention treatment issues is that sanitation, HEPA filters, airborne kind of things being checked first keeps all the pathogens at bay, because if you treat the room correctly, you are going to bring them back in or the air that you're allowing to transfer into the room to lower humidity, to bring CO2 into the room to feed the plant. So we're looking at wanting to quarantine new plants that we're bringing in cuts that we're bringing in as clones to get into the cycle of flowering, because if we let them into the flowering room, it's kind of like we've clinked our hands behind our back. We don't have as many opportunities to get them off the plant. That means pathogens and pests are gonna survive on the flowers, lowering our overall yield, and that makes no farmer happy. So I really want to have observation, wanting to look at the plant leaves, turning them over and looking at them with magnifying glasses, but preferred 20 to 30, 40X kind of jeweler's loops, if not using an electronic one. And we're looking for things to immediately stop and if we see something, we may effectively need to treat the, the ambient air as a climate control, the medium. The colder the room gets, the slower the bugs are going to develop. Some people would say, let's turn the temperature down. I don't have any more bugs hatch. That's not your favorite idea. Turning the temperature up slightly, increasing the bugs metabolism, and then treating them as they hatch. That's the key, because as the egg is formed, it's got an encapsulated protection from all of the things that we talk about that are not nuclear weapons. If we hatch the egg and they start to become embryonic or you know juveniles, now I get a chance to kill them. And every insecticide that I work with has to be used at the right level, but can kill anything that's a live organism on the plant in between the egg hatches. So my goal is sometimes to turn the temperature up slightly, make the ambient room temperature increase within the realm of the plant happiness to make sure the bugs are going to hatch. Get rid of all the bugs, get rid of all the eggs after they've hatched, and now you have them. The plant right behind me, when I first started gardening this from a clone that I got from a local collective, it had rusted mites on it. I identified them, I looked at them, I treated them with some insecticide, they kept coming back because they live in the little teeny section between the petiole and the leaves as they palmate and they hide in the hairs. They're so small, you can hardly see them. I had to start using other conventional means like sulfur dioxide gassing to really bring them out and not have their problems. So you can use beneficial predators and compost teas to make sure that the plant has health. Predator bugs are not normally used inside. They're thrown outside because that's where you're not going to be able to check all the bugs and you've got to learn to live with them and knock back, kind of setting up a perimeter around where your gardening area is to be safe. We inside and outside use conventional sprays, root drenches or medium drenches to affect what might be down below. And I would add a comma, foggers. We use insecticidal foggers, fungicidal foggers, and also sulfur dioxide foggers, especially in Canada, because the government has approved them, as disinfecting the air and also foliar feeding the plant and allowing it to have better health. Sulfur dioxide works as a little bit of a pesticide, especially to mites. It's more or less a deterrent to all bugs because nothing really breathes well when you're gassing the room. But as a pathogen control, it knocks out everything under the hood that we talked about. There's no botrytis in the room. There's no powdery mildew in the room. Root rot is checked as long as you're not overwatering because the, the medium and the environment around it is prone to be inert because you just dioxide treated it with a, a disinfectant, so to say. So I really like treating the room as a whole and not having to spray every individual plant because when you get into spraying, even pump sprayers, it's labor in intensive and it raises the value to have to cover the whole plant. The bigger the plant is, as you see behind me, the more time to cover. This clone, I would just dip into an insecticidal dip, a little gallon bucket that I mixed up, doom, doom, 
dip it in and I would take it and dip its rock wool cube into 1% hydrogen peroxide, making sure the roots were all healthy and that I didn't have anything that was dying to try to give it its best leg up. If I was planting it into organic soil, we'd give it some inoculants to hopefully make the roots happy. If it was going into hydroponics, treating it to not over fertilize it because if you treat the plant poorly at the root level, as we talked about, everything else gets unhappy up above. And sulfur burners, I'm gonna just quickly flip the slide because the key here is that we have a lot of activity around sulfur burning in small to mid-sized gardens throughout America. And in Canada, it's allowed in conventional grows. It's using elemental S, sulfur, in a small pellet form. It's usually called a prill, looks like a lentil and they're collected in these little canisters with heating elements below them inside of a metal shroud. And the reason why they're not allowed in California is they don't have an UL listing. So there's no underwriter laboratory, more or less protecting the, the discharging unit and fire departments don't like them because it's producing something they don't know about. So we need to fix these things because the unit itself is fairly safe. If you're distancing them from the plant, they say up to 10 feet. I've seen them as close as two, as long as the room is not very small. We wanna to try to keep the plants away from the unit because it dusts sulfur into the air and creates a very heavy gas where it's at as a boiling effect. And you want the lights off. I don't normally run fans because you need to permeate the whole space. Nine times out of 10, somebody that's sulfur dioxide in their room is doing it wrong. They're not creating a tent over the garden. Think of the series Breaking Bad when they were fumigating the houses and they covered the whole house. You have to seal the tent close the greenhouse so that it's all sealed because sulfur dioxide floats. It's not like carbon dioxide that's heavier than air, it's up. So it goes up and gets into the creeks and crevices first and then has to permeate down in a cloud to below where the plant is and then touch the floor. So it's hours of burning time or you create more canisters in the room to create more gas to then force it down. The benefit is that it doesn't have a lot of labor. You plug it in, you time it, you exhaust it. Greenhouses, you're, you're not in the room at night so it's when labor is not present and it's fairly quick and easy. And if you're dealing with pathogen problems, it's a knockout. It disinfects the plant and then gives them, I feel a resiliency because it feeds them sulfur. And maybe some of our plants were sulfur deficient. Maybe we're not doing such a good job about being a plant whisperer and understanding what the plant's needs were as it was growing very fast, vegetating and getting started to pre-flower and it got deficient. And then it made it prone to get sick. Much like if we were vitamin D deficient, our immune system goes down. And that's maybe one of the things we need to work on as we see the pandemic kicking up and vitamin D not being used enough in the Northern latitudes. Um, what I'll say about sulfur, the negative is if I've sprayed oil on the plants, soybean stuff, supplicants, even neem oil, it can burn the leaves a little bit and we need to check that and not have oils applied for a couple of weeks prior to it. But sulfur I've seen used into pre-flower and even into some flowering rooms, it makes things smell like rotten eggs, so it's not normally used into flowering and it can damage the stigmas, the little teeny white hairs that come out of the plant, so it's not preferred. Again, we prefer treating in the, the vegging world and letting the flowers develop without any harmful things on them. That's an A-grade grow. The less that's on the flowering plant, the less the labor is involved and the less you're gonna have residual pesticides. Now, just one quick talk about organic fungicides. There's gonna be lots on the market. Regalia is a local company here in California by our Maroon Bio Innovations. It's dead microbes. It's both sprayed on the plant, soaked into the mediums, and it has different effects. It's kind of like a root tonic, but it also limits downy mildew, powdery mildew, and it's organic. We list other biological controls. You could use potassium bicarbonate, which is baking soda. I've seen people use pH up because the pH level on the leaf changes and it doesn't allow the mold to grow. And we also have milk that's been used. One part milk to four parts water somehow does a knockback to most of the powdery mildews and some of the botrytis that you might see. But my favorite weapon is just a 1% mix of hydrogen peroxide. Brown jug is three parts. You mix it with two parts water to one part peroxide maybe a little wetting agent to keep the, the stuff from slipping off in dollops, but spreading out on the leaf. And if you can cover the leaf, you can cover the plant, you pretty much disinfected it. My favorite, if I've brought in clones and I'm worried about them having mildew, is making up that batch of peroxide in the bucket and just dipping and submerging the whole thing. Not trying to overwater the rock wool cube, because remember, I don't want to be a water border, because if you submerge this too much, there's no oxygen in it, and that's really the damage to the small plants is they need to breathe. So I'm at 11.48 and I believe I'm on my last slide. So I'd like to thank everybody um, for listening in and hopefully doing things that are gonna better the ecology of their plants and keep their environmental 
in, concerns intact because we have to learn to live with the fact that the actions that we take, the things that we do to make this plant not have bugs or pathogens are going to have world impact. And we want to try to keep things safe and use conventional and organic mechanisms when possible because it's food grade. We're consuming it. If we're not going to consume it as a cultivator, we're usually manufacturing it for somebody that is. Because not only do I believe we're plant whisperers, but I believe that we are a plant alchemist. We're taking these rudimentary elements of nitrogen, phosphorus, potassiums, and we're turning them into gold. Because anybody that's checked the cost of resin that comes off this plant flower, sold in over-the-counter marketplace, it's right now worth more than gold per gram. Even though gold's really high priced, we're still blowing it out of the water. And our consumers, consumers are going to consume it and stand in line again tomorrow to buy more. That's not the gold market. They don't consume it and buy more. So we have a very bright future if we learn what we're gonna to do to minimize the, the damage to the plant. So I'm glad that you participated today. Thanks so much, Jeff. Um, and I'm gonna just draw from one of the comments that was posted. Um, thank you for the fluid knowledge. It was uh, incredibly, um, articulate. I, I'm pretty confident most folks are going to jump back and uh, and check the video again. There was there was a lot of knowledge uh, uh, that was dropped uh, in a, in a relatively short time. So apologies about any of the technical difficulties we've had, um, but Jeff has agreed to answer a few questions, and we've got quite a few. Awesome. Uh, yeah. I if I can just share that I've learned a lot through growers coming to me with questions because then I drop into their garden for a second, get a kind of mo mode of what they're doing and then the success that they have or the non-success. And I just try to alert them to the things that they can do to right the path. That's my goal is to make everybody get addicted to gardening because if we're all going to be connected to this plant, the government will not intervene in a way of what we've had in our past. Uh, I do not believe that the cannabis plant deserved to be imprisoned. Yeah, and once again, I, I, I do uh, draw your uh, folks' attention to, to get through the Oaksterdam uh, website and, and learn more about uh, all the advocacy work um, champions in, in really helping this whole uh, um, ending the prohibition of, of cannabis. So um, let me just start with, uh, I guess, the first question. You, you did address it, and I uh, it was a question around wettable sulfur and... Um, well, the wettable sulfur is tough because it can clog sprayers, it's minute, and you have to really powder, it has to be micronized in a way that's easy to work with. I prefer using gas sulfur versus wettable, but wettable sulfur and dusting agents, gassing agents through dust, are what a lot of organic grape farmers use and outdoor farmers here in California because it's simple and they're open canopy. And I think that we're going to innovate, we're going to innovate techniques and and technology around the sulfur application that's gonna affect grape farmers. They simply did not have the money to invest into this. We're committing ourselves to hundreds of thousands of dollars a ton, and they get up to 10,000 a ton for grapes. So we're, we're disrupting the agricultural market by innovating and bringing them things that are gonna to help to make them more efficient. And I just am amazed that this is part of what we're going to leave as a legacy is that we were imprisoned for so long. And then as we poke through, we, we created an industry that's gonna change multiple industries around us that were just failing. When, you, when, you, when we think about uh, uh, sulfur in general, when would you feel like it's too late uh, to, to uh, do an application where it might affect uh, aroma or taste? And I've seen people do it before harvest, okay, because they have powdery mildew on their plant and they're trying to disinfect it before they cut it down. I prefer with mildew plants that are heavily, heavily molded outdoor to use a bucket washing method. You look it up on YouTube. There's a couple of guys that use a couple of different methods from peroxide to a, another type of dip that really can make it pass a mold test at a micro level that they send off to the lab because they shake it off. Remember, powdery mildew is not really systemic. Botrytis is, but it's harder to test when it's inside of the plant material that way. So sulfur is really a veg, could be even a cloning mechanism if they have roots because you're disinfecting them small all the way into pre-flower really well. Once you get flowering, it starts to stunt the flowers, especially if you do it at the adequate levels that I'm talking about. It's hours on, not just a few minutes. You gotta build up a gas in the room. I like to bring in a flashlight, you look at the side level, and if you go down to the floor and you see the same dust that's at the top, you're good. If you can see across, it's not there. Kind of think of hotboxing a small space with smoking. You want yeah. it all the way to the floor because it's treating now what's down at the dust level on the floor. And I hate to say it, but I just gas the room. And the only thing that survived my gas room is the plants because I chose to make them survive, at least for the moment. 
Great. Oh, and that uh, leads me into uh, just commenting on on one of your former faculty, or perhaps still is your faculty, Ed Rosenthal, who uh, was a recipient of our uh, Hall of Fame award last year. Um, and Ed's got quite a few videos of the of the old dip technique as well. Um, and that leads me to another question, which uh, uh, I've got a couple of questions around hypochlorous acid. Uh, is that something that you've you've experienced, um, and what's its efficacy like? Yeah, well, that really is is more or less what they consider to be a not a reactive form of bleach, and uh, so it's I, I if I'm reading it correctly, that's used in both disinfectants and processes with irrigation and hydroponics. Some people use it in deep water culture to try to disinfect their tanks. When I came across deep water culture people using bleach, one, three, four milliliters per gallon to disinfect the roots and get rid of what's known as root slime and green algae, I didn't think it was right. I thought they were hurting the plants. And then I researched it. Chlorine's used by the plant. If you don't do too much, it's not going to hurt it. It's a water purity issue. That's why we use it in pools and spas. You don't want to use boron, but bleach can be used. And that's hyperchlorous. It's just the same thing, but more of a non-free agent that's going to react and go out really quickly. It's expensive. What I've seen some farmers using, especially greenhouse growers, is they're changing to uh, ionized water systems, alkaline water systems, filterings that changing the suspension of the water and then treating it on the plant. It's disruptive. I think it's low cost. It's not hurting the plant. And it really doesn't do well for the bugs and the pathogens. They don't know what to do with it because it's not normal. The other thing I've seen people using is ozonated water machines and ozone machines that are treating water because that's a very, very cheap disinfectant for big grows that are working with things that they just got to disinfect. Right. Um Maybe you, you had mentioned uh, BT uh, for the control of, of caterpillars. Uh, do you know if, if BT is something that's going to trigger a microbial, a positive microbial test? We have it as exempted here in California, so you don't even have to have uh, layers of clothing on or things because of the way it's safe for humans. I have not heard that that particular one's causing a problem with a microbe issue, but I have heard another one, which is used uh, Bacillus subtilis. Do you know the BS? Yeah. That one's used in serenade. And serenade's an antifungal. It's sprayed on for powdery mildew, downy mildew. I don't like it because it smells like rotten fish and dead socks together. But some people use it. But that has triggered some microbe tests in some states that have had very finicky microbing tests. And I think what I want to say about microbe testing, chemical analysis testing, heavy metal testing, is I'm all for it to the extent that we're not restricting our industry. I want to be safe, but I don't want to be pharmaceutical grade when we're talking about adult consumer models that nobody tests all the beer that these beer producers put out or all the wine because you don't want to know what's in all that stuff because there's some stuff in it that they not they don't want to tell you. So if we're going to be fairly treated, let's do it across the board for human consumables. I want to see these tests, though, backed away on an as needed basis by the industry letting the, the regulators know what the technical needs are. Because if they're going to test for microbes, let's test for the bad ones only. Let's not test a broad spectrum. Let's go after the ones that are going to cause harm and focus on them so that the other ones can be used and deployed safely. Because if they're not harmful to humans, pets, or more importantly, bees, then we're game on. But if they're harming bees, let's test for them. So I've seen a big rash use of, the, of a couple of insecticidal products that have bacteriums in it that hurt bees. Let's turn those down unless we're in indoor environments, very controlled small environments. Normally they're effectively problematic to the water. The fogger that's made by a company up in Canada, Dr. Doom, it's allowable in states. It's on a regulated market to be used. It's gotten problems though, because users are using it in the flowering room and it's now staying on the product and then coming out in the test where it should never have been used there. They didn't have an IPM program limiting what got into their flowering room. I believe if it's used on veg plants, whether it's the perthrin, the vital product that's in there that more or less accelerates the perthrin's use on the plant, the leftovers are there because they were late runned. The less we do in the flowering rooms, the less residual toxics we're going to have on the plant, unless it's organically broken down. Perthrin should be being broken down in a heavy littered room in days. So I'm thinking these people were using them the week of their harvest or a couple of weeks before, and they used them so heavy because they had problems. They need to do more IPM, more integrative pest management control in their veg flowering or pre-flowering in their mother rooms so it doesn't go through the chain. And that's really what quarantine is about for a home gardener. If you're introducing new plants into a room that has other plants, you've just infected everything. And we just need to think about that more and be cautious. I don't want to be paranoid because paranoia would have never made me jump into advocacy around cannabis. All my friends kept telling me I was crazy and I was going to ruin my life. I kept saying, I want to change everybody's lives and make cannabis more available like alcohol. 
Um, yeah, and, and Jeff, Jeff has uh, alluded to the fact that uh, in Canada and under the regulated industry, we, we have very set uh, biopesticides and, and products that we're allowed to use uh, to, to regulate our pests and pathogens. So, uh, but our, our audience is home growers as well as, as those that are in the regulated if, if I could add to that too, the, the downside is we don't have a federal marketplace yet allowed. So this is a state by state patchwork. Colorado is different and more restrictive than Oregon is. And Oregon is less restrictive than, than California. And California is most restrictive. And Washington doesn't even test for pesticides yet. I, I, I slap myself because they, they put out the notice to the growers. Should we test for pesticides? And the growers resoundingly said, oh no, because they don't want to have that problem of all their stuff being rejected or recalled. I think we need to get to a point where that is identified and maybe Washington might take the lead in doing things that are tested on an as needed basis because they see problems in the consumer marketplace. It, we should be protecting consumers when we do these tests, not just restricting plant growth or plant use. And right now we have a problem because the EPA won't allow us to use insecticides and herbicides and things on the plant because it's not on the label. So I'm <clears throat> really animate that our new administration focus on changing the cannabis laws, regulating it. And due to the interactions that I've had with our vice president, soon to be, I hope that that's going to happen. I don't necessarily trust the Biden administration solely because he's kind of wanting to put us in treatment. We need to put his feet to the fire and say, we don't deserve treatment. We deserve regulation and safe consumer model. Tax us. Uh, I think we got uh, one last question because I think it's a long one. Um, and it's speaking, if you could share a little bit more of your knowledge around uh, beneficials and, and predatory uh, bugs, and in particular, maybe speaking around um, the root aphid and, and now something we've got, thanks to the U.S., uh, the cannabis aphid. Yeah, um, those, are, those are tough. And the root aphids, a lot of smaller growers just eject all their material and don't bring it back in. It's difficult. I mean, I've not seen a really super easy way to deal with root aphids. One of my most practical ways of dealing with it in a pot was I bagged the pot with a, like a trash bag and sealed it up around the stock and the root aphids couldn't come out. And then I treated it with oil products that were very diluted to try to smother and suffocate them. And I had good results. I actually harvested the crop. There was no root aphids up flying around, which is normal because they go to an adult stage to try to get away from their mound. But root aphids are difficult because they're in the medium. So <clears throat> if you let them survive from the vegging room into the flowering room, you may not have a success. And that's a lot to do with a lot of the bugs that are there. And I try to focus on ridding them in the, in the vegging rooms. And that's doing a few things. So it's not even a target that I do after one bug as much as the few things that I'm doing in the vegging rooms are gonna limit any bug getting through because I'm eliminating their ability to go through their egg cycle. Whether it's a, a pyrethrin spray or fogger, whether it's literally dipping them as babies to get rid of the, the material that's on any clones or cuts that we have. It's really a focus of making sure the moms are clean. If the mothering plants are clean where we're getting our harvested clones or cuts, everything else starts to be clean unless we're contaminating it with ourselves. Uh, I have to say with aphids, it's usually pyrethrins because they're slow moving and they're feeding and you can hit them. Um, it's tough though when they get into the root side because you can't use pyrethrins in the root. It really hurts the roots. So I've seen neems used in different products. I think bacteriums are gonna be the best. What I noticed about my root aphids when I sealed them up, the humidity changed down there and they all got like a mold on them, both on the dead bodies and everything that was around. And I was, I, I don't have enough specificity to harvest the mold and try to isolate and say, where do we go with this? But I really believe we're gonna innovate some of these solutions for some of these types of predator problems that we can't solve with predators indoors because the predator bugs inside, unless they're bacteriums are problematic because they're suicidal. Ladybugs fly into our heated lights sitting up on the LEDs or flying into the HIDs and burning up. Um, if they're flying insects that we're using as controls, they all die pretty much from our high lights. If they're on the plant though, they can survive and do damage, but then we're putting insects on the plant that are gonna have byproducts and frass, decompositional, more or less defecation. So we're gonna to have to learn to live with some organic material in the plant flower that's produced by our predator bugs, or we're gonna to have to eliminate all the bugs together. So I, I always say with organic gardening, you gotta to learn to live with it, that your gardening plant's gonna have some bug stuff on it whether it's dead bodies, whether it's organic defecation, whether it was a good bug or a bad bug, I'm not gonna differentiate or discriminate, but it's gonna be there. Our goal is to try to eliminate those things from being a hazard to the consumer. And I'll tell you the root aphid and the cannabis aphid, they're new and they're problematic. And I see a lot of small farmers wanna just throw their arms up and quit because they don't like what it does to the plant. And I say, you have to be perseverant, you have to be persistent and you have to understand its life cycle and try to get ahead of it. 
but when you're in the medium to treat it, it's tough. So I say the root aphid and the fungus gnat are sometimes the most difficult to eliminate from gardens. Some growers will change mediums because usually the root aphid comes in either on the root cube and dipping it as this stage, I can eliminate it pretty easily because I'm treating it a couple times a week and doing things with it disruptive. When it gets into the big state that's behind me, the root that's down below in a big six inch rock roll cube, they live in rock roll around the sides, they put their eggs into it. There's almost no way to easily eliminate it. I found them to be rather persistently problematic. I've experimented with some heavy duty stuff that you would never want to consume the plants that were experimented with. The problem, that stuff works. And I'm very sad about it. Bear Sciences, Imachloroplid, the neonicotines, they're heavily used. They used to be able to buy them at Walmart by the pallet here. I worked over time through Oaksterdam in classes to eliminate them from the marketplace by telling people to go talk to their, their seller and say, you know, you're killing the bees with that. You're going to kill everybody in society. Why are you doing that? They ban them in other countries. But here in America, our EPA is rolling back those things because of the, the Trump policies about wanting to be pro-business. So we hope that that might change a little bit because I think we just need to use some foresight that what we put in the environment should be safe enough and decomposition and quick enough that we don't see it lasting damage from it. And that's where we can innovate. I believe because we have a fast growing plant, because we have something that's a high value target that comes out like we're growing gold, we're going to definitely affect agriculture in beneficial ways that I really am happy about, about not only the risks that I took early on when nobody wanted to see this moved at a, at a governmental level, but also the ability to see our tax revenue used to rebuild infrastructure and focus on things that we would want to do after we've made a million dollars and are doing philanthropy. Well, the government's helping to do it for us by changing the legitimacy of our issue by taxing us and regulating us in a way that's helpful. I just don't want to be restricted when it doesn't need to be. Wow. Um, I think, uh, I think unfortunately, um, we, we should probably wrap up, but I want to give a uh, tremendous thanks to uh, you for your presentation, uh, to you and Dale for all the work that you do. Uh, Jeff was gracious enough to share his email. Um, Dale has encouraged you to visit the website. I encourage you to visit the website of Oaksterdam and hopefully uh, either drop into uh, to Oakland or drop by virtually um, uh, it if I could add one more thing, I noticed in the chat that was mentioned about heat, and I could talk forever about different techniques that I've been involved in. I've read some research around heat being used in greenhouses, scalding water, uh, high temperature rooms. It works awesomely. The problem is it damages plants, roots, and leaves. But if you do it at the right time, you humidify the room correctly, it's almost as if you are steam bathing it. But you have to get the temperatures up ambiently up above 110 degrees, north of 110 and you're starting to burst eggs, you're starting to rupture insects and it'll kill everything. But the medium takes more time to be effectively treated. So in a root aphid scenario, you might actually work with steam. But then if you heat the roots too much, it's lasting damage and it takes weeks and months. So I always say, cut a clone, leave behind the root aphids and start with something fresh and disinfect this heavily before it gets into the next stage. Because what you're trying to do is remove the most contaminated parts. And when I was using heat treatments, I had trouble because heaters won't get that hot because they kick off because of the regulators. So you have to unhook them. And when you start to get north of 105, liners, more or less plastic stuff starts bending and molding and it's just not necessarily friendly, but it does eradicate it. And what they saw in greenhouses were they were taking cuts like this that were infected with bugs or the rooter above, and they were dipping them into the hot water just really fast dunk, dunk, and then setting them up. And they were seeing really rapid kickback of the bugs with no insecticide. There's nothing in the water besides just it being hot. And that's because heat will affect it. Just like we don't like having our hands stuck in scalding water quickly, it's, it's burning but on a small insect level, it's dead. All you have to do is take a net, put a little fly in it and run it under your tap water that gets as hot as just your tap water, pull it back out. It's not that it drowned it, it cooked. Just in a couple of seconds, it'll cook right in the, in the stream of water. That's, you know, great, great advice. Right, right at the end, uh, another knowledge bomb. I think uh, it really speaks to uh, your passion, your interest, and your learnings from other growers uh, in sharing that. That's uh, incredibly valuable. Thanks so much for the share. You're welcome.